Well, if you've spent a good amount of time in church, there's probably a good chance that you have been hurt by the church. Perhaps you've had unfulfilled expectations or unrealistic expectations, and the church did not just did not meet what you thought it should meet. It did not fulfill what you felt it should fulfill. Perhaps you went to a church and you have had drama with other Christians, and that drama left you reeling. I thought these people were supposed to be better than that. I thought they were supposed to act different than that. What's worse is when, what's worse than both of these things, however, is when you've been used and hurt by church leadership. It's far more painful. The sting is that much sharper when those who are supposed to care about your well-being use you for their own ends. And we may wonder to ourselves, why are these people in leadership? What are they doing in the church? Why are they leading God's people? And where is God in all of it? Well, this morning, we're going to see Jesus' perspective on those in spiritual leadership who use their position to take advantage of God's people. So John chapter 10 Verse 1 through 10. Jesus says, Truly, truly, I say to you, he who does not enter by the sheep door, the sheepfold by the door, but climbs in by another way, that man is a thief and a robber. But he who enters by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To him the gatekeeper opens. The sheep hear his voice, and he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he has brought out all his own, he goes before them. And the shepherd will follow him, for they know his voice. A stranger they will not follow, but they will flee from him, for they do not know the voice of strangers. This figure of speech Jesus used with them, but they did not understand what he was saying to them. So Jesus again said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. All who come before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not listen to them. I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I come that they might have life and have it abundantly. Let's pray and then we'll unpack this text this morning. Let's pray. Father, this morning we we are so grateful for all of that you have done. We're so thankful for the work of Jesus, our great high priest, We've sung about him. We, we know he right now is in your presence on our behalf. And Father, as we look at this text this morning about shepherds, this Jesus as the true shepherd, as the good shepherd, and as we contrast him with those who take advantage of your people, I ask that you would help us to, to see your beauty, to see your kindness, your compassion, your glory, and that we would be able to identify those who are interested only in what they can gain from your people. Speak to your people through your word this morning. Build them up. In Christ's name, amen. Well, in John 9, the the chapter before this, we encountered the man who was born blind from birth. He wasn't in this condition because of his sin or the sin of his parents. He was blind, we saw, so that way Jesus could heal him. A miraculous healing that would lead untold numbers of people to faith in Jesus Christ. The healing occurred on the Sabbath day, which is going to lead to a confrontation between Jesus and the Pharisees. You all remember the story? They, they come up with this fake investigation to prove their point. The Pharisees displayed their willful blindness. They had already made up their minds that Jesus wasn't from God because he broke their man-made regulations for the Sabbath day. After interviewing the man and interviewing his parents and then interviewing the man again, the Pharisees did not get what they were looking for. Instead, what they got was a man who was growing in his understanding of Jesus' identity. With that knowledge of Jesus being God, the man increased in his boldness and he actually came to challenge the Pharisees. And we know the story. He was cast out by the Pharisees. He was excommunicated from the synagogue. Jesus pursued him, sought him out, and saved him. The chapter closed with the Pharisees expressing their disgust at Jesus, describing their blindness. 
John 10, our text this morning, continues right where John 9 left off. The setting is the same. The characters are the same. Jesus' healing of the blind man has led to his interacting with the Pharisees. He has called out their blindness. And this morning, he is going to go on the attack. So let's look at verse 1 through 6, where we see the good shepherd, or, or the true shepherd, or just the shepherd. Verse 1, Jesus says, Truly, truly, I say to you, he who does not enter by the sheepfold by the door, but climbs in by another way, that man is a thief and a robber. Jesus begins this discourse, this, this teaching on the good shepherd by saying truly, truly, or, or amen, amen. Uh, in other words, what he is going to say is of great importance. Uh, pay attention. What I'm going to tell you is profound. It's, it's true. It's true truth. He, he tells the disciples, he tells the blind man, and he tells the Pharisees that are nearby a parable, a figure of speech, an allegory. John 10 as we're going to see in the, in the coming weeks, is the great shepherd, the good shepherd discourse. It's, it's one of the most familiar images that we have of Jesus, his being a shepherd. Perhaps it's one of those words that comes to your mind when you think of Jesus. It's, it's uh, Jesus, in our text this morning, Jesus talks about sheep. He talks about gatekeepers and he talks about shepherds. He uses elements that while not all familiar to us in our day, would have been really familiar to the experiences of the everyday person who heard him. Or, or maybe you grew up on the reservation or you would, you know, in the summertime go out and help your grandparents with the sheep. These, these elements would be familiar to you as well. And, and notice the, the situation Jesus here describes. He describes people who are up to no good. They, they, they don't enter the sheepfold by, by the door. The, these people, they, they climb in another way. Jesus is talking here about thieves and robbers. He says the, the person who doesn't come in through the front door, who comes in by another way, that person is a thief and a robber. Well, well, what is the difference between a thief and a robber? Well, the word here, thief, kleptis, uh, means exactly what the ESV translates it as, thief. Uh, this is someone who steals. Uh, you, you, when I said kleptis, you probably thought, oh, kleptomaniac, kleptomania. Uh, yeah, that, that, that word kleptomaniac comes from this word uh, kleptis. Uh, it's just someone who steals something. So a thief is someone who steals. But notice Jesus says those, those who are coming from a, another way, coming not through the door, they are thieves. They're, they're some, they're, they are stealers. Uh, they're those who steal, kleptis, but they're also robbers. The word here is lestis. Uh, a robber uh, is it, it, it translated here as robber. It's, it means a bandit or a, a plunderer, a, a rebel, a highwayman, a pirate. Uh, this, is a, this isn't just stealing. This is like forceful taking, uh, a violent taking. Um, when a pirate comes up um, to rob you and to rob your booty, he does, not, uh, he does not ask permission. He just takes. Takes his sword, his gun, whatever. That, you know, look at me. I'm the captain now. That's what he does, right? He's, he's a pirate. He just takes over. You comply or not, it doesn't matter. Uh, listen to me or you're going to die. Right? That's the idea here. It's someone who's going to forcefully take something. Uh, this word robber, lestes, would be used to describe Barabbas. You remember Barabbas? Barabbas was the guy who the Jews picked over Jesus to release. John 18, 40, they cried out again, not this man, but Barabbas. And then John notes, now Barabbas was a robber. Again, we're not talking here about someone who just steals something. We're talking about someone who's going to murder somebody to take what they have. It's a forceful taking. Now, Jesus' focus here is not to isn't here so much to distinguish between the thief and the robber. Like, like the point Jesus is making here is not like, here's how you know a thief. He just takes. Here's how you know a robber. He's going to kill you, then take. That, that's not really what he's about here. I mean, th these are closely related concepts. And, and Jesus isn't here trying to distinguish between the two. That's not his point. That's not important. What is important, however, is who... Jesus identifies as the thief and as the robber. Remember the context. Remember who Jesus is talking to. 
The gathered people around Jesus are the blind man, the Pharisees, and whoever just happened to be around. Jesus here is calling the Pharisees thieves and robbers. While well, hinted at here in verse 1, it's, made, it's a point that's made clear in verse 8. So you're in John 10, look down to verse 8. Jesus says, All who came before me are thieves and robbers. Jesus here very clearly is identifying the Pharisees as thieves and as robbers. Well, in what ways were the Pharisees and other religious leaders in Israel's day, namely the Sadducees, thieves and robbers? Well, they were thieves and robbers because they were taking advantage of God's people. The Sadducees, in particular, were known for, for their lavish lifestyles, a, a lavish, luxurious lifestyle that was paid for by the common man. They were living it up while the common religious Jew was fighting for survival. They were thieves and robbers because they were leading God's people astray. Instead of properly teaching God's word to these people, they, they added their own rules, their own teaching, their own doctrine. And things that were designed for man's rest and health, like the Sabbath, they became burdensome and crushing. The Pharisees and the Sadducees were thieves and robbers because they didn't take care of God's people. They used them. They didn't care about them. We, we talked about this briefly last time we were in John's Gospel when we were considering how the blind man would have felt after being betrayed by his religious leaders. The, the, the Pharisees weren't interested in him. They, they weren't all interested in the stunning, life-changing reality that he was blind, but he had been healed. No, no, they, they only cared about what they could gain from him. They weren't interested in this man for him. How's he doing? How can we help him? How can we build him up? How can we teach him the scripture? How can we shepherd him? How can we care for him? How can we pray for him? No, 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 no. They were only interested in him because in their mind, they could use him. And once they were done with using him and, and once he didn't give them what they needed, they cast him out. He was dead to them. And perhaps you felt this way as well. Maybe you have been hurt by a church. You felt used by a spiritual leader. When you're in their presence, they're energetic and caring and fun. And they make you feel like you're the most important, significant person at the time. You, you, you spend time with them and you think, man, this, this, this pastor, this deacon, this, this small group leader, they really care about me. They get me. They love me. But then you cross them wrong. You don't do for them what they want you to do. And that's it. The tech stop. The, the checking in stops. The energy stops. The vibes change entirely. Because they didn't care about you. They cared about your money. They cared about your gifts. Oh, you're, you're a guitar player? We need to keep this guy. This guy's very important. Oh, uh, you, you, this, this one, this guy right here, he, he pays 20% of the church's income. We need to make sure we pamper this guy and make sure he's all good. Like this happens. This happens all the time. They're, they're interested in what you can contribute to the ministry. They, they don't care about you. They care about what you can give to the church, how you can build up their church, their little kingdom. And, and that's what's going on here. So-called spiritual leaders take advantage of people in our day. And, and if you've been in church before, uh, you probably have experienced this. They take advantage of people today. They took advantage of people back then. This is what the Pharisees were doing. This is what they did with the blind man. They didn't care about him. He didn't do what they needed him to do, so they cast him out. This was a situation that was loudly condemned in the Bible. 
And this is the text, you know, the the very long text that Jenna read this morning in our scripture reading. Ezekiel 34, verse 2 through 10. I want you to turn there. Um, So turn with me to Ezekiel 34, because I want you to see this as as I read along. Ezekiel 34. And we're going to be looking at verse 2 through 10. And this here is, is God describing uh, those who should be shepherding his people, but who aren't. Look what it says. The word of the Lord came to me. Son of man, prophesy against the shepherds of Israel. Now again, this is not talking about literal shepherds, like, like the, the dudes who spend all day in the fields with the sheep. We're, God's not... He's not going out against actual literal shepherds. When, when he's talking about shepherds, he's talking about spiritual leaders in Israel, those who, who were supposed to guide God's people. So he says, prophesy against the shepherds of Israel. Prophesy and say to them, even to the shepherds, thus says the Lord God, ah, shepherds of Israel who have been feeding yourselves. Should not shepherds feed the sheep? You eat the fat. You clothe yourselves with the wool. You slaughter the fat ones, but you do not feed the sheep. The weak you have not strengthened. The sick you have not healed. The injured you have not bound up. The strayed you have not brought back. The lost you have not sought. And with force in harshness, harshness, you have ruled them. He there describes what poor spiritual leadership looks like. Poor spiritual leadership isn't concerned about the people, just doesn't care. Uh, they, they go away, they go missing. They, they stop coming to Sunday service, they stop coming to, to small group, they stop, you know, they distance themselves from the church. This kind of spiritual leader, this kind of shepherd, doesn't care. He doesn't. He said he doesn't go after them. He doesn't seek for the lost. He doesn't, he, those who are strained, he doesn't try to get. He does not care. He takes advantage of them. The shepherd is going, going to eat the fat. He's going to clothe themselves in the wool. Oh, you, you give to the church? You, you contribute to my ministry? All right, you're important to me. I'm going to take care of you. Uh, he, he doesn't steward God's money well. He, he, he uses the church's money as his own thing, his own little trust fund. He's not a good steward of the resources God has given him. Verse 5. Well, what about the sheep? What happens? What happens to the sheep when you have a bad shepherd? Verse 5. They were scattered because there was no shepherd, and they became food for all of the wild beasts. My sheep were scattered and and they wandered all over the mountains and on every high hill. My sheep were scattered all over the face of the earth with none to search or seek for them. Therefore, you shepherds, hear the word of the Lord. As I live, declares the Lord God, surely because my sheep have become a prey and my sheep have become food for all of the wild beasts since there was no shepherd and because my shepherds have not searched for my sheep, but the shepherds have fed themselves. And have not fed my sheep. Therefore, you shepherds, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord God, Behold, I am against the shepherds, and I will require my sheep at their hand and put a stop to their feeding the sheep. No longer shall the shepherds feed themselves. I will rescue my sheep from their mouths that they may not be food for them. The situation, what happens when you have sheep who are uncared for by the shepherds is they wander around. They, they go all around the hills, all around the mountains, and this leaves them vulnerable, vulnerable to wild beasts. The, the metaphor, the analogy works very, very well, which is why it's used here in the scripture. When pastors aren't shepherding their people, the people, that would be you, the sheep, they wander. They explore strange doctrines, strange teachings. And it's the pastor's job, the shepherd's job, to intervene and say, listen, this guy you're listening to, this, this spiritual leader you're reading, you're being influenced by, this person is a heretic. Or, or this person is wrong in this way. 
Like the shepherd's job is to protect the sheep because if he doesn't protect the sheep, the wolves are going to come and they're going to kill the sheep. They're going to eat the sheep. That's his job. He's to care for them, feed them, protect them, and lead them. Turn back to John 10, to our text. These Pharisees were supposed to be the shepherds of God's people But they were not. They weren't gentle shepherds at all. They weren't shepherds at all. They were thieves and they were robbers. They took advantage of God's people for their own gain. They used them. So Jesus calls them what they are, thieves and robbers. And and this is shocking language, really. The, The Pharisees are the most respected people in Israel at this time. They are the religious elite. They are the people who you would look to for spiritual guidance. They were examples of godliness. If you were a Jew at this time, you, you looked at the Pharisees. Like, like you want to know who, who the really godly people are, the really pietistic people, the real worshipers of God? You look to the Pharisees. And it's these people, the most respected people in the whole nation, that Jesus calls thieves and robbers. What we can learn from this is that Jesus has no tolerance for false teachers. There is, when it it comes to false teachers, when it comes to bad shepherds, when it comes to them, there is no gentleness. There is no dialogue. And there is no mincing words about those who lead God's people astray. Jesus doesn't mince words here. He isn't concerned about his tone. He calls these teachers exactly what they are. They are thieves and they are robbers. J.C. Ryle commenting on this text says this, let it be noted that these strong epithets show plainly that there are times when it is right to rebuke sharply. Flattering everybody and complimenting all teachers who are zealous and earnest without reference to their soundness in the faith, is not according to Scripture. Nothing seems so offensive to Christ as a false teacher of religion, a false prophet, or a false shepherd. Nothing ought to be so much dreaded in the church, and if needful, to be so plainly rebuked, opposed, and exposed. Jesus' tone here is not nice. It's not gentle. Jesus doesn't say, well, I know you have a good heart and you have a good motivation, but you're kind of leading my people astray. Can you please stop it? No. To their face, you're a thief. You're a robber. You're you're, you're stealing. You're plundering. You're a murderer. You're, You're here to harm my people. Jesus identified these religious leaders as abusive. They're taking advantage of his people. They're thieves and they're robbers. And they exist in the church today just as much as they existed in Jesus's day. Just because someone is called a pastor does not mean that they are a good shepherd. Uh, Pastor, the word pastor, poimeon, shepherd, literally what it is. You could call me Shepherd Josh, I guess. Um, A pastor does not, just because you are a pastor does not mean you get the stamp of approval. No. There are bad pastors. There are a lot of bad pastors. But Jesus here, after calling out these bad pastors, he contrasts them with himself. Verse two, he is the good shepherd. He is the true shepherd. Verse two, but he who enters by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To him, the gatekeeper opens. The sheep hears his voice and he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. Unlike the Pharisees and the Sadducees, Jesus isn't a thief or or a robber. He he isn't here to take from God's people or or to use them or to take advantage of them. No, he he doesn't enter through a backward way. He, He isn't sneaky. He's the shepherd and the shepherd goes through the front door because they don't have anything to hide. There's no alternative motive. It's plain and clear. The shepherd is there to take care of the sheep. 
Jesus states that the gatekeeper sees the shepherd and opens the door. There's some discussion when you read commentaries about the identity of the gatekeeper. Who's the gatekeeper? What's the gatekeeper's role in the church? It's the gatekeeper of pastors. You know, Jesus is the great shepherd. You have the under shepherd as a pastor. He's the gatekeeper. No, that, th those really aren't really important questions. Uh, the, the, the gatekeeper is not really significant at all uh, to what Jesus is talking about. Uh, a gatekeeper in those days were hired by, by families to guard the entrance where the, where the sheep were kept. So, so usually what happened was, um, you know, because you're poor, you're, you're a poor Jew living in those days, uh, you didn't have money for your own pen. So you would get in with a bunch of families and you would put all of your animals together in one place and together you would all pitch in and you'd hire someone who would, who would guard the gate. And, and the point of the gatekeeper in the story is he recognizes the shepherd and lets the shepherd in. The emphasis is all on the shepherd. Uh, the gatekeeper is going to let the shepherd in because he knows the, shep the shepherd isn't a threat. The emphasis here, of course, is all on Jesus. He is the shepherd. He is the good shepherd. There, there are prophecies in the Old Testament that describe the coming Messiah, the Savior, as a shepherd. Ezekiel 34, 23 through 24. I will set up over them one shepherd, my servant David, and he shall feed them. He shall feed them and be their shepherd. And I, the Lord, will be their God, and my servant David shall be prince among them. I am the Lord. I have spoken. Ezekiel 37, 24. My servant David shall be king over them, and they shall have one shepherd. They shall walk in my rules and be careful to obey my statutes. Micah 2, 5, or Micah 5, 2 through 4. Directly, all of these are applicable to Jesus, but this one is, is so obvious. But you, O Bethlehem, who are too little to be among the clans of Judah, from you shall come forth for me, one who is to be the ruler in Israel, whose coming forth is from of old, from ancient of days. Therefore he shall give them up until the time when she who is in labor has given birth. Then the rest of his brothers shall return to the people of Israel, and he shall stand and shepherd his flock in the strength of the Lord, in the majesty of the name of the Lord his God. In John 10, Jesus' self-description is that of a good shepherd. He is a shepherd who leads his sheep. John 10, 3-4. To him, the gatekeeper opens, the sheep hear his voice. He calls out his own sheep by name and leads them out. And when he has brought the, all of them out, he goes before them and the sheep follow him for they know his voice. Jesus as a good shepherd not only leads his sheep, but he protects his sheep. Look at verse 7. So Jesus said to them, truly, truly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. All who come before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not listen to them. I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and go in and out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I come that they might have life and have it abundantly. He's the doorkeeper. He's, he's going to guard the sheep from thieves and robbers. Not only does Jesus as a good shepherd lead his sheep and protect his sheep, he sacrifices himself for the sheep. Look down at verse 11. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. He who is a hired hand and not a shepherd, who does not own the sheep, sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flees. And the wolf snatches them and scatters them. He flees because he is a hired hand and cares nothing for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I know my own and my own know me. Just as the father knows me and I know the father and I lay my life down for the sheep. Jesus as a good shepherd leads his sheep. He protects his sheep. He sacrifices himself for his sheep. And finally, he pursues his sheep. Look at verse 16. And I have other sheep that are not of this fold. I must bring them also, and they will listen to my voice. So there will be one flock and one shepherd. In John 10, Jesus is the good shepherd. The, she the good shepherd who leads his sheep. The good shepherd who protects his sheep. The good shepherd who sacrifices himself for his sheep. And the good shepherd who pursues his sheep sheep. 
Later on in the New Testament, Jesus will be called a a a shepherd by other writers, like Peter in 1 Peter 2.25. Listen to to how Peter says this. He says, For you were strained like sheep, but have now returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. Or 1 Peter 5, 4. And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the unfolding, unfading crown of glory. Speaking of Jesus, the author of Hebrews writes this in Hebrews 13, verse 20 and 21. Now may the God of peace who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep, by the blood of the eternal covenant, equip you with everything good that you may do his will, working in us that which is pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. So Jesus is the good shepherd. And, and look, what, look what Jesus says next. He says that the sheep, look at verse 3, the gate, to him the gatekeeper opens. The sheep hears his voice. He calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. The, the sheep recognize the voice of the shepherd. They they respond to the voice. Jesus calls out his own people. He calls them by name. He he knows them. He loves them. And he leads them. As a Christian, you are one of God's sheep. You matter to him. You aren't just some dumb sheep that he's going to use for himself, that he's going to shear for his clothes or, or, or he's going to make mutton stew out of you. That, that's, that's not what he's going to do to you. Like, that's what the Pharisees were doing. They were using and abusing God's people. Not Jesus. I mean, he cares about you. He knows you by name. The, the, he, he knows how many hairs you have on your head. He knit you together, the psalm says, when you were in the womb. He crafted you. He created you. He calls you out and he leads you. What comfort you and I, dear brother and sister, can have in these verses. So Jesus as the good shepherd, he, he leads us. And look at verse 4. We're going to see his leadership described, the shepherd's leadership described. Verse 4. When he had brought out all his own, he goes before them and the sheep follow him for they know his voice. In our Western culture, shepherds lead their sheep from behind. They, they drive them along. They, they have a sheepdog, and the sheepdog's going to be like the enforcer, right? He's like the little, little sheep bouncer, and he's going to just send them away. Or, or maybe you got a lazy shepherd, and he's, you know, he's in his side-by-side, and he's just chasing the sheep around. Or, or maybe you, know, you, um, uh, you got on a horse, and you're just riding along, and you're going you're gonna to drive those sheep where they need to go. But, but in, in the Middle East, Back then, and even today, shepherds don't, don't drive the sheep. They, they lead them. Uh, they stand in front of them, and, and they lead the way. The, the sheep follow the shepherd. Uh, the shepherd goes before them. They know his voice, and they follow him. The psalmist describes this very thing in the most well-known, one of the most well-known beloved passages in all of the Bible, Psalm 23. Psalm 23, 1 through 6. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. We can take immense comfort in Jesus as our shepherd here. He is the shepherd who leads us, but but more than that, he is the shepherd that knows exactly how the sheep are feeling. Jesus isn't just a God who who is distant from us. Jesus is a God who joined himself to humanity. John 1.14, the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And in his becoming human, God the Son, Jesus, experienced all of the hardships, 
all of the afflictions and all of the temptations that we face. Isaiah 53, 3. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. Hebrews 4, 14 through 16. Since then we have a great high priest, which we sing about this morning before the throne of God above. Since then we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God. Let us hold fast our confession. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are yet without sin. Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Hebrews 5.2 He can deal gently with the ignorant and the wayward since he himself is beset with weakness. We can and we must go to our leader, to our shepherd, and cry out to him and cling to him. You may be going through something right now that, that nobody understands, that nobody gets, and you feel alone. But the truth is you're not alone. And Jesus knows how you're feeling and what you're going through, and your good shepherd, Jesus, leads you. He knows you, and he has experienced all that you're already going through and will go through, and he tells you to hold fast to him. And to cry out to him. And notice what Jesus says. That the sheep follow him because they know his voice. Are you listening to the voice of Jesus? Are you immersing yourself in his word? The Bible. That's where he speaks. He does not speak in dreams. He does not speak in visions. He does not speak in prophecies or new revelations. He speaks through the Bible. 2 Timothy 3, 16 through 17. All scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. Verse five. A stranger they will not follow, but they will flee from him, for they do not know the voice of strangers. What, what Jesus describes here is the reality that true Christians, true Christians, instinctively recognize false shepherds. True Christians will hesitate at the voice of a stranger. They, they will recognize truth and turn their backs on error. John 8, 31 through 32. So Jesus said to the Jews who had believed him, if you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples and you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. True Christians recognize truth. That's not to say that some Christians may not be duped for season. I mean, that's a reality that the Bible warns against. Like Jesus in Matthew 7, where he says, Beware of false prophets who come in sheep's clothing, but in inwardly are ravenous wolves. Or Paul, warning the Ephesian elders in Acts 20, 29-30, he says, I know after my departure, fierce wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. And from your own selves will arise men, speaking twisted things to draw away the disciples after them. The biggest threat, the gravest danger to the church is not external. It's not outside of the church. It's not the world. It's not the government. It's not persecution. It's none of that. The greatest thre threat to the church of Christ is within. False teaching. False teachers. Those who come and that you trust who lead God's people astray. That is the biggest threat to the church of Christ. And this is why it's critical that you know the voice of Jesus. That you can recognize, well, that that's, that's doesn't sound like my shepherd. Like you're saying this, but that doesn't really sound like, like my shepherd. I, I read the Bible, that doesn't sound like something Jesus would say or something that God would do. The reason why true Christians follow the voice of Jesus and don't follow the voice of strangers, the reason why Christians remain in truth and reject error, the reason why Christians embrace Christ and reject false teachers is because true Christians have the Holy Spirit living within them. 1 John 2, 20 through 24. But you have been anointed by the Holy One 
and you have all knowledge. I write to you not because you do not know the truth, but because you know it, and because no lies of the truth. Who is the liar but he who denies that Jesus is the Christ? This is the Antichrist. He who denies the Father and the Son, no one who denies the, fa- the Son has the Father. Whoever confesses the Son has the Father also. Let what you heard from the beginning abide in you. If what you heard from the beginning abides in you, then you too will abide in the Son and in the Father. You, as a Christian, may have experienced this before. You hear someone preaching the Bible or, or teaching a doctrine and, and something just sets with you wrong. You, you, you really can't explain it. You, you, just get, you just have this gut feeling. Like, that doesn't, doesn't sound right. Or, or maybe you've attended a church or, or been in a worship service and you felt darkness or, or heaviness there. You, you just didn't feel right about the whole situation. That's what John is describing here. That's it. You have this anointing uh, from the Holy Spirit. If someone persists in error, if they abandon Christ, the true shepherd, for another religion, another way of salvation, they were never saved in the first place. 1 John 2, 19 through 20. But they went out from us. But they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would have continued with us. But they went out, that it may be plain that they are not of us. But you have been anointed by the Holy One, and you have all knowledge. Jesus here in our, in our text has both attacked the Pharisees, calling them thieves and robbers, and established that unlike them, he is the true shepherd. He is the good shepherd. Well, how would the Pharisees respond to this? Verse 6. This figure of speech Jesus used with them, but they did not understand what he was saying to them. They, they, simply put, they, they don't get it. They don't, they don't follow. They're not, they're not on the same wavelength with him. So in verse 7 through 10, he's going to explain it further. And when he uses this with this point to here, the door, the door, verse 7. Jesus again said to them, truly, truly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. He says, truly, truly, take note. What I'm saying is important. He, he then changes the figure of the speech. But the, he, he now changes the allegory. Before he was the shepherd, now he calls himself the door. He, he does this to make his, his meaning very, very clear. Remember, the sheep are the people of God. Jesus says he is the door to the sheep. In other words, he is the only way into the people of God. You can only enter the fold through Jesus. He is the only way to God. Look at verse 8. He again contrasts himself with the Pharisees. All who come before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not listen to them. Those who came before Jesus, namely the religious leaders, the Pharisees and the Sadducees, they are thieves and robbers. They aren't the way to God. They aren't the way to become God's people. You don't enter into God their way. You enter into the fold. You become one of God's people through the door, who is Jesus. And this is the point he again repeats in verse 9. Look at verse 9. I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. He again says that he is the door. If anyone enters by him, he will be saved. Well, one of the clear teachings of the Bible is that Jesus is the only way to heaven. Jesus is the only way someone can be saved. Jesus is the only way anyone can become a child of God. John 14, 6, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Acts 4, 11 through 12, this Jesus is the stone that was rejected by you the builders, which has become the cornerstone. And there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven by which we must be saved. One of the driving dogmas of our age is tolerance and acceptance. And while there is nothing wrong with tolerance or acceptance, it becomes wrong when it's tolerance of error and acceptance of lies. In other words, in other words, the message of Christianity 
is that salvation is exclusively through Jesus Christ. Those who go to heaven are only those who repent of their sin and trust in Christ alone for their salvation. There are no other ways. Christianity alone is the truth. Jesus says he is the way, the truth, and the life. And notice what he says. Those, those who embrace Christ, they go in and out and find pasture. To become a Christian is to f- experience true freedom. Psalm 119, verse 44 and 45. I will keep your law continually forever and ever, and I shall walk in a wide place, for I have sought your precepts. You want true freedom? You want to live the way that God made you to live? Live so under his law. There you will find true freedom. Those who embrace Christ, who enter through the door by him, they find pasture. They find their rest in him. This is what Psalm 23 was talking about. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. This is an idyllic scene. This is what all of our souls long for, to enter into his rest, to enter into that glorious pasture. It's what Gandalf describes to Pippin in Return of the King. You you remember the scene? Surely you do. Minas Tirith is falling apart. The, the, The army of of they're coming, they're going to they're gonna wipe it out, Gondor is falling, and Gandalf is sitting there, you know, Gandalf the wizard, he's sitting there with Pippin, the hobbit, and you know, the, the, the orcs are like, trying to, are like breaking through, and uh, Pippin is looking at Gandalf, and he says, uh, yeah, you didn't think Gandalf would be on the, on the screen today, well, he is. Um, Pippin is looking at Gandalf, and he says to Gandalf, I didn't think it would end this way, they're about to die, right? And Gandalf says, end? No, the journey doesn't end here. Death is just another path, one that we all must take. The gray rain curtain of this world rolls back and all turns to silver glass, and then you see it. To which Pippin says, what, Gandalf? See what? And then, of course, you know, you know the, in the movie, the, it cuts to the ram, and then you have Howard Shore score with the violin, it's beautiful, whatever it is. And Gandalf says, white shores and beyond, a far green country under a swift sunrise. That's it. That's what we're talking about here. It's that green pasture. It's that longing that all of us like hear and feel. Uh, When I got that quotation last night, I watched the video on YouTube, that scene, and I was reading through the comments And people are like, that scene gets me every time. Oh, I'm crying right now. I just can't make it through that. I'm I'm assuming that not every person who comments on that video on YouTube is a Christian. In other words, there's something deep within our heart that yearns for those green pastures, that, that yearns for what Gandalf is describing, that rest and that comfort. And while we all yearn for heaven, Even those who don't believe in heaven, they yearn for it. They just don't know it. The reality is that green pastures aren't just heaven. Like Gandalf is is half right. In other words, while we will be ushered into eternal bliss at our death, we do experience joy and life abundant here and now. Look what Jesus says in verse 10. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I come that they might have life and have it abundantly. Pharisees, man-made religion, false Christianity, it only comes to kill and to destroy. It uses God's people, it takes advantage of them, and it destroys them. Jesus, however, came that we might have life and that we might have it abundantly. When, When we receive Jesus as our Savior, when we submit to him as our Lord, we have eternal life. When we become Christians, we have heaven waiting for us. 
but we also have abundant life here and now. A life that exceeds expectations. A life that is true life. So many people are living but aren't alive. Not so for God's people. When you become a Christian, you live the life that you were made for. When you live your life God's way in obedience to him, you experience the joy and the delight that he has for you. Well-known ver- well verse here at Higher Ground, Psalm 1611. You make known to me the path of life. In your presence there is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. This morning, we've heard the shepherd's voice. He has called out, exposed, and rebuked false teachers. He has contrasted himself with them and shown us that he is the good shepherd who takes care of us and leads us into abundant life. Are you following him this morning? Are you listening to his voice in the reading of the Bible? Have you even entered into the fold? Are you truly one of his sheep? If not, I hope this morning you will resolve to do so. Let's pray. Father, this morning we have seen that you are the true shepherd, that Jesus is the good shepherd. We have seen that you and Jesus are not like these man-made false teachers. You don't take advantage of people. You don't use them for your end. Instead, you lead us and protect us and care for us, and feed us. So Father, I pray this morning, if there's anyone in here who's not a Christian, they're outside of the fold, that you would effectually draw them to yourself, that you would call them, that you would save them. And Father, for your people this morning, I, I ask that you would help us to rest in you, to follow your voice, to, to trust you as our good shepherd, that you will lead us to this abundant life in the here and now, that our joy, our delight, and our pleasure, and our rest will be in you alone. Christ, I'm going to pray. Amen.